So the topic for today is creating a maritime English board game. In order to become a proficient user of maritime and naval English, maritime professionals must first master a significant amount of job-specific vocabulary. Ship types, ship parts, jobs, ranks, ratings, equipment and facilities of ports, the naval environment, navigational aids, buoys, movements, position, the weather, the weather forecast, the HF Pro words, to name only a few, make up a whole new vocabulary which must be learned first before a maritime professional can even begin to make a decent sentence. Now, part of the problem is also that this job-specific vocabulary must be acquired, and by acquired I do mean memorized, by learners who at the time of learning do not yet master the actual extra-linguistic reality that the words refer to, because they are uncommon even to the native speaker. Indeed, when a naval cadet arrives at Econaval, not only does he not know what the word for, say, a windlass, for example, is, but he does not know either what a windlass is in French, or what a windlass is actually used for in real life. Now, part of the difficulty that the naval English teacher is faced with is to teach job-specific vocabulary to students who do not yet know the job and thus the French equivalents for those terms, so that French to English vocabulary lists, for example, are of no use. Now, if you add to that the very specific SMCP grammar, SMCP means Standard Marine Communication Phrases, it's the uh, set of standard phrases that is used by mariners all around the world, if you add to that the VHF radio procedure, you quickly realize that the difficulty of the of the task at hand. But of course, this is not new or unusual for anyone in this room because you're all teachers of English for specific purposes. A famous experiment compared learners of four groups. The first group was taught something only once. The second group was made to thoroughly work, understand the same information, having even to explain it to someone else. The third group was repeatedly quizzed about that information. And the last group was merely presented with that information, but several times over a few months. After six months, the researchers checked to see which of the four groups best remembered the information. Which group do you think did best? Was it group A, that was taught information only once? Group B, the one that conducted a thorough study, achieved deeper understanding, had to teach it themselves to other people? Group C, the one that was repeatedly quizzed? Or group D, the one that was simply uh, presented with the information uh, several times. The vast majority of teachers would vote for group B, the group which had a better understanding of the material and had to teach it themselves. And that is, of course, wrong. The group that did best is, in fact, group C, the group that was repeatedly quizzed about the information. And this is to do with the electrochemical nature of learning in your brain. Memory, you see, is often conceptualized as a hard drive in a computer. People generally think that knowledge is stored in a learner's brain waiting to be retrieved later. But that is in fact a misconception. Neuroscience has shown that a memory is in fact a production of information at the time of remembering and not a retrieval of a pre-existing something in your brain. It is the repetition of having to remember that creates the electrochemical connections, the synapses in the neurons of the brain, that will enable you to remember when needed. In other words, if you want to remember something, nothing works better than repeated quizzing. In fact, Research has shown that repeated quizzes tend to both slow down and reduce forgetfulness, a principle known as the spacing effect. Therefore, 
we sought to increase the amount of time devoted to quizzing within our Maritime English Basics course. Now, the problem with repeated quizzes is that they are no fun, and that they seldom allow for collective revision. Therefore, we have endeavored to create a learning tool that will allow learners to quiz each other while still being enjoyable. Being board game geeks ourselves, we simply decided to create a board game. This presentation will first shortly explain the reasons which led us to create such a learning instrument and what the benefits of game-based learning are before describing the game itself. Then we'll play a bit together, and then we'll end with some questions and answers. So to begin with, a bit of learning, uh, games and learning theory. Why play? Game-based learning has recently been restricted to the use of computer games in education, the games being either off-the-shelf commercial games used in class, a practice referred to as uh, in the literature as serious gaming, or purpose-built software products referred to as serious games. However, non-digital games can also be used for learning, including board games, card games, role-playing games, etc. Yes, but why play? Game-based learning is socio-constructivist learning. It is built on theories such as situated learning, experiential learning, and activity theory. In situated learning, games provide information in a relevant context or setting. Learning takes place alongside social interaction or collaboration. Experiential learning advocates learning by doing. Activity theory posits that games promote learning through error by allowing learners to participate and experiment in non-threatening scenarios where error is penalty-free. While game-based learning may not work in every situation, the literature shows that potential benefits are significant. Games appeal to learners. They create a better learning atmosphere and they keep learners more focused. We've not test played this game with students yet because we're still prototyping it, but we have tested the questions and, and the uh, quizzing mechanic with the use of a, a digital tool that you may know called Socrative. It's a quizzing tool. So we've, we've tested that and they love it. Now, we can only suppose that they're going to even prefer it when we add the actual board. But in the future, we will test it, we'll study it, and try to measure the effects of the game. Another added benefit of games is, of course, that they rely on the spacing effect. Students would remember things better if they studied them or quizzed themselves regularly. The problem is, they don't. But with a game, it is possible to imagine that maybe they're going to revise on a more regular basis. Now let's look at the game itself. The game is played on the board picturing a map of the world. Other game material includes ship cards, destination cards, and question cards, as well as six-sided dice. A smartphone, or MP3 player, or a computer can be used to listen to audio questions. The map is divided into hexagon tiles. On some of these tiles, harbors are marked. Their position is, of course, consistent with that of the real harbor. We chose the 50 largest commercial harbors in terms of tonnage, to which we added a dozen extra harbors, either because they were famous ports or large military harbors, like uh, Norfolk, for example, that our learners are likely to call at. We only kept one port when two of the list happened to be on the same tile, and we also ensured that ports were evenly spread out throughout the world for the sake of playability. The goal of the game is to earn victory points by traveling from one port to another. The player with the most victory points at the end of the game is the winner. However, in order to be able to move on the board, players must answer Maritime English related questions. In the beginning of the game, each player draws a ship card. 
These are 10 by 15 centimeter cards which list the data about a vessel. We've chosen both commercial and military vessels, one of the goals being to revise the vocabulary of ship types. Each vessel has a name and identification information, like their IMO number, their MNSI number, their call signs, that kind of thing. They also have an assigned port, a port of registry, a port of departure, which may be different, and uh, each card also mentions the physical characteristics for each vessel, like their length overall, their beam, their draft, their dead weight, their displacement, as well as other information which may be needed during the game, like the number of people on board, for example. Also, some of the vessels have restrictions, such as being too large for the Panama or Suez canals, for example. This will have an impact on the possible routes for those vessels. All data has been based on existing vessels to ensure consistency. When the game begins, each player draws a destination card, which he or she places on the table before himself, visible to everyone. They are 6 by 10 centimeter cards, which show one of the ports of destination, with its name in a picture, and its position on the map, as well as a digit representing the number of victory points which the player gets for reaching the destination. There are three cards for each destination, each paying between 1 and 7 points. For each destination, there is one yellow card which pays the base rate for that destination, as well as a green card which pays the base rate plus 1, and a red card which pays minus 1. The number of points for each port has been set based on the geographic location of ports. Thus, a port that is very central in the playing board, such as Marseille France, for example, will yield fewer points, while a port that is far on the outside uh, edges of the board, like Vancouver, Canada, for example, will yield more points, because it will take more time to get there, thus being realistic in real life, the cost of maritime transportation is based primarily on the distance to cross. If a player is lucky, he or she will draw destination cards of nearby ports. But if they're not lucky, they may have to cross the whole board several times. And this kind of element of unpredictability boosts fun. When it's a player's turn to play, they roll the dice. They move forward a number of tiles equal to the dice roll in the direction of their destination. Then, the player sitting on their right must draw a question card. They will ask the question on the card, and if answered correctly, the player will roll again, and move forward a number of tiles equal to the, the dice roll. After which, it is the next player's turn to play. In other words, when it is your turn to play, you always move once, and you may move twice if you answer correctly. However, each player only gets to answer one question, because we wanted the game to be fast-paced, and avoid inactive players getting bored while a um, knowledgeable player successfully answered every question. I mean, we've all been uh, in games where there's a guy who could answer every question. After a while, it becomes quite boring. This ensures that all relatively good players remain within a few points from each other in order not to discourage them and to preserve their hopes of winning. When a player's ship comes into the destination port, he or she discards the destination card, scores the points, draws another one. The game ends either if after a set amount of time, after a set number of turns, or when a player reaches a target score. Questions are of several types. We have multiple choice questions. We have open-ended questions. We have uh, visual questions. Pro words, so questions uh, for which the answer is a uh, reserved word of maritime English language or its definition. Uh, find the odd one, so there, as the name indicates, there are series of four where one is different from the other. We have say it in maritime English. That's a translation exercise from English to maritime English or from maritime English to English. We have audio questions. These are questions of comprehension uh, based on an audio file that is played when you scan a QR code that's on the card. And we have the challenge questions. So these are generally dialogue or longer um, formatted answer. 
So how about we play together so that you can see what the game looks like. So here are our four players. Blue, red, green, and pink. Each of them is a ship. And as you can see, there are ships of various types. A gas tanker, a cruise liner, a container ship, and an oil tanker. One of them has a special restriction. The oil tanker is too big to uh, pass through a canal. The others can pass through a canal, but they must pay a fee. That will cost them two victory points. So the first player is the blue player. Their uh, port of departure, as their card indicates, is Colon in Panama. So they draw a destination card. Hey, it's the port of Brest in France. What a coincidence, my town of origin. When they arrive to Brest, they'll score two victory points. They roll the dice, and they get a five. So they move five tiles in the direction of Brest. One, two, three, four, five. As you can see, they have carefully avoided that pink area on the board. That pink area is known as the Bermuda Triangle. This is one of the special areas in which uh, students must do a challenge. So this is a difficult question, a very difficult question, very long. So in general, students will try to avoid them. If, nonetheless, they stop on uh, one of those tiles, they will have to uh, answer a difficult question, but if they succeed, they'll score five extra victory points, which may be a strategy to score if you consider you're good enough to do it. We'll see an example of that in a minute. So their question is this. On merchant vessels, what is the captain usually called? And the correct answer is... Master. Yes. Oh, feedback. One thing I did not mention is the importance of feedback. Research has shown that in the case of multiple choice questions in particular, no feedback or simple right-wrong feedback may hinder learning, actually, or facilitate memorization of wrong information. Uh, because you, you print all four answers, and if you don't give feedback, you have a 50% chance that they remember of a wrong answer. So it's therefore of utmost importance that players get proper feedback when they give a wrong answer. Thus, short feedback text is included on each question card. So they roll the dice again. This time they get a four. One, two, three, four. And now it's the red player's turn to play. So they depart from New York, as the card indicates. They are going to Turkey, to Amarli, for two points. They roll the dice. They get a six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Their question is a visual question. This picture shows... Does anybody know? The correct answer is a starboard lateral mark. A subui, which you generally leave on your right-hand side of your ship when you are entering a port. A bit of feedback, which would be read to the student. They roll the dice again. And this time they score four. One, two, three, four. Next player. This time it's the green player's turn to play. So they uh, depart from Hong Kong and they're going to Marseille, France. The four points. That's relatively far. And they're going to have to cross the Suez Canal. And they square three. One, two, three. They stop just before the Malacca Strait, famous for its piracy. Question. Find the odd one. When last capstan fairly or helm? The, uh, the answer is, of course, helm. Because the helm is the only piece of equipment that is found on the bridge of a ship and not on the forecastle, like the other three. That feedback would be read to the student. They roll again. Five. Uh-oh. They must stop. This means that next time, before they play, they'll have to do a challenge. Because it's a special area. Next ship to play is the pink ship. That's an oil tanker. They cannot pass through... Um, the canals, so we hope for them they're not going to Europe. 
Lucky them, they're going to Darwin, Australia, which is very close for a huge seven points. They roll three. One, two, three. Question. In the VHF, what procedure word should you pronounce to say, please, can you repeat what you have just said? The correct answer is, say again, say again your last. A bit of feedback that would be read to the student. They roll again. They get a two. One, two. Land at last. So they score their points, their seven points. They draw another card. They're going to Durban, South Africa, which is not too far for a massive six points again. And now we go back to the blue player. They roll. They roll a three. One, two, three. And this time it's an audio question. So the student must take their smartphone and scan this QR code to read the sound. You can scan it if you want yourself. If not, here is the sound. Mayday, 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 all ships, all ships, all ships. This is USS Rushmore, callsign Sierra Echo Hotel Kilo, mayday. Rushmore in position bearing 159 degrees two, distance 5 nautical miles from Harbor Island Light. I have an out of control fire in the galley. Two men are burnt. No medical staff on board. Require firefighting and medical assistance. Question for this student is what is the nature of the problem? Can you answer that? Yes, you're good. It is a fire, a fire in the galley, out of control. Bit of feedback. Roll again. Three. One, two, three. Right, we're not going to continue uh, to play for too long, but I'd like just to look at one of the questions. And that is, remember, the green player? They have to do a challenge. So what does a challenge look like? It looks like this. So this is the card which they have. And the scenario is this. You are at sea. You are attacked by pirates. You send the appropriate message on the VHF. They are given a position. And that's it. They must make the message. So to get the extra five points, they would have to say this. All of it. Or a relatively large part of it. At the end of that, uh, the rest of the players would vote to decide whether they did well enough or not. And if they did, they get five extra points. So as you can see, this is a longer uh, speaking task. So this time it's a message. Sometimes it can also be a dialogue. So they'll have to play a dialogue with another uh, player. So the card would designate the player on the left or the player on the right, for example, to play with them. That's it. You've seen uh, how the game uh, functions. Now, if you have questions, I would be very glad to answer them. Thank you for listening to this.